Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming to this uh, exciting, hopefully, seminar on the Bill of Rights Bill. Uh, I'm Victor Bacchale, and uh, with great pleasure, I am going to be introducing to you five extremely, uh, sorry, six, in fact, I can't count, extremely uh, eminent speakers. Uh, it is five, I don't know why. I think I, think I was imagining there was another one. So four are in the room and one is virtual, and we'll leave it to you to get who is virtual. So there are two up there. Um, we have this evening Professor David Bellman, Emeritus Radford Professor of English at University of Cambridge, uh, Professor Paul Craig, who is virtual. Hello, Paul. Uh, the Emeritus Professor of English at University of Oxford, uh, Professor Alison Young, the Sir David Williams. Professor of Public Law, University of Cambridge, Sir Jonathan Jones, they're all basically professors or honorary professors, I should um, <laughs> preempt it. Uh, Sir Jonathan Jones, formerly Treasury Assistant, honorary professor of law, University of Durham. And last but not least, uh, Robert Spano, former president of the European Court of Human Rights, and also, thankfully, a visiting professor of law, this time at University of Oxford. Anyway, um, I am uh, very pleased first to introduce uh, Jonathan, who will talk to you about the impact of the bill in the relationship between Parliament and government. Jonathan Jones. Thank you very much, Vikram. We've sort of divided this up. Um, it's quite difficult to divide it up, really. Um, but for the sake of creating chunks, I'm going to talk, as Vikram says, about the relationship between Parliament and, and the government. Um, both under the Human Rights Act as it stands and how that would change under the Bill of Rights Bill. And Alison in particular is going to look at the relationship between Parliament and the courts. And these things, of course, all um, overlap and intertwine. Um, but the Bill of Rights Bill is definitely intended to make a difference to those relationships. But the Conservative Party manifesto in 2019 promised merely to update the Human Rights Act and administrative law, that's another subject, to ensure that there is a proper balance between the rights of individuals, our vital national security, and effective government. And the Human Rights Review under Sir Peter Gross had the aim, among other things, of examining the impact of the Human Rights Act on the relationship between the judiciary executive and parliament. Um, by the way, Peter Gross has said that he doesn't regard the Bill of Rights Bill as any kind of response to his consultation. But anyway, um, the Bill of Rights Bill is what we've got. Now, the Human Rights Act 1998 was really all about parliament deliberately constraining the powers of the executive and other public bodies and Jack Straw, who was then the Home Secretary introducing the bill that became the Human Rights Act, said the power of the executive will be reduced by the bill, by, in other words, by the Human Rights Act, because the state will be made more accountable for its acts and omissions to its citizens. And I think we can take it that the current government takes the view that this process of curbing the powers of the executive has gone too far. And this is one of the impetuses for reform. And bluntly, the Human Rights Act, and incidentally, the European Convention, stops the government from doing things which it wants to do, like deporting foreign criminals and other undesirables. And this is partly because of what the government regards as an over-expansive interpretation of the Convention rights, both by domestic courts and by the European Court of Human Rights. And the MOJ consultation, that's the one that didn't respond to Peter Gross, the MOJ consultation said the shift of lawmaking power away from Parliament towards the courts in defining rights and weighing them against the broad public interest has resulted in a democratic deficit. And the MOJ consultation also referred to the growth of a rights culture, citing, for example, multiple claims by prisoners. Although it observes 
that these claims were unsuccessful. Um, and, and further, the MOJ said that the Human Rights Act, in particular through the development of positive obligations, had created additional legal uncertainty and costs for public authorities in carrying out the functions that Parliament has entrusted to them. And the government wants to ensure those professionals delivering vital public services on the front line have the legal certainty to enable them to discharge their duties effectively. So if you boil all that down, I think really what the government is saying is that when it enacted the Human Rights Act, Parliament, let's remember that passing the Human Rights Act was itself the act of a sovereign parliament. But in doing so, it's turned out that Parliament took too much power away from the government and incidentally gave too much to the courts. In particular, and Alison will talk about this in more detail, through the Section 3 duty of consistent interpretation and the duty in Section 2 to take into account decisions of the Transfer Court. So that, I think, is more or less, or at least part of the premise for the Bill of Rights Act. That all of this, in the government's view, has got out of balance. Too much power taken from the government and given to the courts. Um, what does the Bill of Rights Bill do about this? In one sense, there are limits to what the bill can do, because it's premised on the UK's continued membership of the ECHR. And we've had more recent comments from, from the Prime Minister and the Justice Secretary and the Home Secretary implying that leaving the ECHR is at the very least not off the table, quote. But the Gross Review and the MOJ consultation and the Bill of Rights Bill itself are all based on the assumption of continued participation the convention. Hence, the rights covered by the bill are exactly the same convention rights as those in the Human Rights Act. They're all set out in Schedule 1 again. And the talk of adding specifically British rights has come to nothing. Um, the less said, the better about pointless clause nine on jury trial. So it's all the same rights. Secondly, the UK remains subject to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights. So if individuals fail in enforcing their rights in the UK courts, and as I think we'll probably discuss, I think the bill is designed to make it more likely that such claims will fail. They will still be able to take their cases to Strasbourg. If they win in Strasbourg, the UK government will be bound by the convention to remedy the breach. So the government's room for manoeuvre in the bill is limited, and this attempt to square the circle, to limit the enforcement of rights, while essentially keeping the same rights and participating in the same rights convention, is one of the reasons why the bill is such a mess, in my view. However, the bill does attempt uh, to reduce some aspects of the burden on government, taking that the point I start with, which is that the government considers that its business, the business of government, is too constrained by the Human Rights Act. So how does the bill reduce those constraints? A number of provisions require the courts to take restrictive interpretations of particular rights in particular circumstances. For example, clause five says, clause five deals with positive obligations, that a court may not adopt a post, uh, a post bill interpretation of a communication of a convention right, which would require a public authority to comply with a positive obligation, but also limits tries to limit the application of pre-commencement interpretations giving rise to positive obligations. So that's one attempt to rein in the scope of the HRA. Clause 6 essentially tells the courts to take a narrower interpretation of rights in circumstances if the claimant is subject to a custodial sentence. And clause 8, perhaps most strikingly of all, tells the courts to take an extremely narrow interpretation of the Article 8 rights of any foreign criminal of whom the Secretary of State is considering deporting. And it's a complicated provision, Article 8, but anyway, it's designed to tell the courts to take a very, very narrow interpretation of Article 8 
in those circumstances, only finding a breach if there is manifest harm to the individual, which is extreme, this is all the language of Clause 8, in the sense of being exceptional and overwhelming, and in case, either irreversible or incapable of being mitigated. So we can talk in more detail about the provision, but basically the point is to tell the courts to give the government more slack when uh, giving effect to or interpreting particular rights in particular situations. It's also worth noting briefly the approach of the bill to interim measures issued by the Strasbourg Court, so Rule 39 indications, and these have obviously proved anathema to the government, particularly the, the recent indication given in respect of proposed deportations to Rwanda. And on that topic, the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, said that British people are rightly baffled why our immigration controls can still be blocked by European judges. It's time, it's time to complete Brexit, the a giveaway, um, and let the British people decide who can and cannot stay in our country. So clause one three of the bill affirms that the judgments, decisions, and so on, and interim measures of the Strasbourg Court are not part of domestic law and do not affect the right of the Parliament to legislate. But then they never did anyway. But clause 24 goes further and says that for the purposes of determining any rights or obligations under domestic law, no account is to be taken of any interim measures issued by the European Court of Human Rights. So again, this is obviously intended to allow the government to do things which the Strasbourg Court thinks it shouldn't do, potentially putting the UK on a collision course with Strasbourg. Finally, a couple of other features of the bill, particularly dealing with the relationship between the government, the courts, and Parliament. First, uh, as now under the Human Rights Act, the bill does not allow a court to strike down a provision of primary legislation. It allows the court to make a declaration of incompatibility, and that's clause 10. But additionally, however, the court contains an extended power to make a declaration of incompatibility in respect of secondary legislation. So under section four of the Human Rights Act, this only happens if secondary legislation cannot be read compatibly with the convention because of some provision of primary legislation. But now, with the disappearance of section three, so there's, there's no, now no duty to interpret compatibly with the convention, the making of a declaration of incompatibility or secondary legislation is at the court's discretion. And the parliamentary, the Joint Committee on Human Rights in Parliament considers, I would say rightly, that Clause 10 would probably lead to more declarations of incompatibility. In other words, the courts would be less likely to strike down incompatible secondary legislation, um, but may instead make declarations of incompatibility under the Clause 10 power. This would probably be welcome to the government but would not give claimants an effective remedy. So that's another shifting of the balance, if you like. Um, second, um, the Bill of Rights Bill does away with the requirement in Section 19 of the Human Rights Act for the Minister in charge of the bill to make a statement about compatibility with the Convention. And the, the JCHR describes this as deeply problematic. Um, and I can say from my own experience in government, Section 19 has undoubtedly imposed a great discipline on ministers and civil servants in assessing the rights indications of legislation and explaining them to Parliament, so supplemented by the Human Rights Memorandum, which is provided to Parliament for each bill. And it's difficult to see any good reason for getting rid of it. It, it would, in my view, be another weakening of human rights protection in our system. Uh, but the bill gets rid of that. Um, section 25 of the bill does contain a new provision requiring the government to notify Parliament of adverse findings against the UK by the, by the European Court of Human Rights or any declaration by the UK of a failure to comply with the Convention. And the JCSR, JCHR says that sort of information is to be welcomed, but it could be done without legislation, so it's pretty... Um, I'm enthusiastic about that. So, um, so in summary, 
I've just skipped over a few examples of ways in which this bill attempts to tackle what I think the government regards as the, one of the mischiefs of the HRA. The HRA constrained the powers of the executive, and one of the long standing problems with the HRA is that it has been interpreted in ways that stops the government from doing things it should do. The Bill of Rights attempts to address that in various ways I've talked about. Uh, it's fiendishly complicated um, in ways I'm sure we can come on to, um, which uh, itself is likely to generate litigation. So that would be fun for those of us who practice. Um, uh, but if the bill worked as intended, it will make it more difficult for claimants to enforce their rights in UK courts. I think that is the point. Um, but then in turn, that means that there are more likely to be more cases going to Strasbourg. And then, as I said, the government will have to fight those cases, presumably. And if it loses, what's the point? Um, because it will have to comply um, or put itself in breach of the convention, uh, in which case the bill doesn't square the circle at all. So that I will pause and pass on. Thank you. Jeff before. Before I have two other announcements I've got for the first is uh, there is an alarm. If, if there's going to be fire, there will be an alarm, and you evacuate the building via the staircase. On the left, the lift bank, do not use the lift and don't re enter until you're told to. Secondly, this tonight uh, is being recorded. So when we get to questions, please don't say your name uh, and we'll just keep it anonymous. Thank you. Over to you, Alison. Thank you. So I hope my talk is not so alarming that you feel the need to leave the building um, after the alarm or not after the alarm, but I'll, I'll try and, and make it slightly less alarming. Uh, so I've been asked to talk about the relationship between Parliament and the courts. And um, as Jonathan has, has um, introduced in his talk at the beginning, essentially the aim of this is to say, we think the courts have got too much power, so we're going to push the power of the courts down and we're going to increase the power of parliament. And that's the main message that we get as we look through the different provisions of the bill. Now, as Jonathan has already mentioned, I, I felt it needed commemorating. Um, we put a little stone there. Um, rest in peace section, please. It's been so nice knowing you. Um, one of the main elements is section three is going to be repealed. So that's one of the main ways in which we're changing the relationship between parliament and courts. And the reason it's got question marks after the date is we still do not know what is happening with this bill. It's still hanging around, having had friends reading, waiting to see what's happening, how it's going to time with the parliamentary sessions, whether it will not make it in this one, make it the next one, we're still unsure. So it's got question marks as to when it will finally um, be laid to rest. Um, and that's we're still trying to work out where we are. The second thing is um, we do have the preservation, and as Jonathan's mentioned, a slight expansion of declarations of incompatibility. And finally, we have everyone's favorite clause, clause seven, um, which uh, some of my students have referred to as deference on steroids. Um, so we'll have a look and see if that is what it means and what its consequences might be. So here are the lovely clauses that repeal section three for you. So clause one to be lovingly tells us courts are no longer required to read and give effect to legislation so far as possible in a way which is compatible with the convention. Right, so far, so good. And then we get everyone's favorite, what is it doing clause, clause 40. Because what clause 40 then does is give a power to the Secretary of State to make regulations, always get these lovely transitional saving provisions regulations this is what it's doing and then it lovingly tells us that this includes the ability to preserve or restore to any extent the relevant judgment of the court which they need a relevant judgment interpreting legislation that appears to be made in reliance on section three of the hra which of course get everyone looking at that and saying is this just a belts and braces provision is it just recognizing that if you repeal section three, then you might get uh, people in court saying, well, I know we're used to interpret this legislation this way, but we did that because we relied on section three, but section three is now no more. So we can't possibly rely on this anymore because the instruction to do so has gone because section three has been repealed. 
So we then have clause 40. So the minister can go through, look at all the interpretations and think, let's preserve this one and go away and enact a regulation to preserve these particular provisions. That could be what it's doing. It could be belts and braces. It could be sending the indication that actually all of them go. They all die, they all go, unless they're being revived. I'm not 100% sure. My other difficulty with this is how do you know that it has been made in reliance on section three? Because often in these cases, you'll get cases that will use common law provisions that will say, well, I would interpret it this way anyway. And oh, isn't this interesting? It just also happens to be one that happens in other section three. It's that good. So it's going to be very difficult to unpick was this in section three? But then we're told it has to appear. So if the minister thinks it appears to have been remade on sex three, it can still be being rescued. So this is going to give rise, I think, to lots of problems of trying to work out was this an interpretation based on section three? If so, has it disappeared? Is there a regulation that's reviving it? If there isn't a regulation that's reviving it, do I have to go back to the old interpretation or kind of separate that out and say, well, I can still interpret it this way anyway without section three, because section three didn't add all that much anyway. So if, if there's a good news story, you're going to have great fun litigating and trying to work out the ins and outs of what is and is not preserved and where it goes. So this is uh, the concern about section three, not only does it go, but do all the interpretations go alongside it? And if so, how far is clause 40 going to rescue any of them? So anyway, I'm trying to give good news. But if you want some other good news, there's a tiny, tiny sort of exception, which is for everyone's favourite right, free speech. Because obviously we don't like some rights, but we do like free speech. We particularly like free speech if when we're dealing with cases against slaps or against privacy. Then we like free speech. We're not so sure about free speech when it comes to determining criminal proceedings. That's the, no, not those. We're not so sure about free speech when it's to do with disclosure information that will be in breach of confidence, not those. And we're also not sure about right to end to remain in the UK or citizenship cases or no effect on national security. But when it's not those, then you must give great weight to freedom of speech and the importance of protecting that right. And that can include when you're dealing with interpretation of legislation. So you don't have to use section three, but if you're not in these exceptions, do give great weight to the importance of free speech, whatever that means. Because we're not sure what free speech means. Do they mean free speech, the convention right? Do they mean free speech over and above the convention right? Because there's no mention of the convention right here. And if so, what is free speech that isn't found in convention rights? What will it entail? And how do we give great weight to it? So again, you are my good news story. Good news for litigators trying to work out what this all means as we go forward. Then we have the preservation of declarations of incompatibility. And um, then we have the standard element of being able to use primary or secondary legislation in response to declarations of incompatibility and has done with them, as already said. This is broader now than it used to be or will be with regard to subordinate legislation. You do not have to say that um, you're needing a declaration of incompatibility because you are, can't use section three because the prime legislation won't let you do this. You have a declaration of incompatibility for any form of subordinate legislation once this comes in. So again, the push might be towards more declarations of incompatibility. And there were some concerns raised in uh, the um, Independent Human Rights Act review about the extent to which delegated legislation gets struck down because it breaches the convention right. So there's also disputes about precisely how many cases do see examples of being struck down. But I think this was the concern is the this broad thing of being able to have a declaration of incompatibility for subordinate legislation. So at least we still have those. Then we have deference on steroids. Everyone's favorite clause, clause seven. This applies when the court is determining whether an act is compatible with convention rights or whether a public authority is acting contrary to convention rights. When you're in situations where you will have to determine whether the convention right strikes an appropriate balance between either different the rights and policy aims, the rights and the convention rights, or convention rights of different persons. When you're in that particular situation, the court must regard Parliament as having decided in passing the act that the act strikes an appropriate balance. Great. 
So polymer plastic, it must be an appropriate balance, so therefore it must be compatible with convention. Hang on a minute. Also have to give the greatest possible weight to the principle that in a parliamentary democracy, decisions about how such a balance should be made are struck properly by parliament. There's very much an instruction defer more greatly than you already are deferring when you're determining the content or convention of rights. And my suggestion is maybe this could be read slightly differently. And this is to pick up on what was going on in the SC case. So in the SC case, you have um, discussion as to when you can use Hansard when you're trying to determine the ins and outs of convention rights and how they're balanced. And there's an element of if you can see evidence that Parliament has actually thought about the balance of the right, then you should give more deference in those situations than when you don't have evidence and Hansard can be used to show evidence that Parliament has actually discussed the matter. Clause 7 is almost suggesting you don't need the evidence because the fact that Parliament has an act shows that it's, that it's made the appropriate balance. You don't have to give any evidence that they've actually gone away and thought about it. So it could be a response to that. My other element is it keeps referring to this body called Parliament. So Parliament is decided to obstruct the right balance. We have a parliamentary democracy, and these decisions are properly made by Parliament. That's Parliament, not the government. So how much evidence can you be able to say, well, I'm not sure in this act of Parliament, Parliament was doing this, was it just the government? I'm not sure there's much leeway for that. But it is a reference here to Parliament, not to the government. Also, it applies to when you're striking an appropriate balance. Was that only the fair, just a reasonable component of proportionality and not the suitability and necessity? Components because necessity can do quite a lot of work. So, can you be more stringent there because it's not just about striking the appropriate balance? So, I've tried to give an account of what I think is the relationship between Parliament and the courts. The idea is to decrease courts, increase Parliament. Parliament, not government. And there may be some ways in which we we're interpreting it. It doesn't quite go as far as we might think. But you will have lots of fun litigating this. Thank you very much. So next we've got Robert on the relationship between the UK and the ETHR. Thank you very much, Vikram. It's a great pleasure to be with you here today. Um, I come at this a bit differently. As you can imagine, uh, having just stepped down from the European Court of Human Rights as the president of the court and have been engaged in this discussion over the past few years from that vantage point. I'm going to proceed in four parts. Firstly, I want to shed some light on the current situation in relation to the rate relationship between the Strasbourg Court and the United Kingdom. What are the facts? What are the facts that we are currently confronted with? I then want to take as a given the premise uh, just, just discussed by Jonathan and Allison. The premise of the current government is that the government intends to stay within the convention system. And I want to ask, uh, what does that mean from the perspective of the convention? And I may then be having to refer to some provisions of the convention, which I think are necessary to, to reflect on what that action, what that claim actually means and what that purports, what obligations arise from that basic premise. And I also talk about some clauses of the Bill of Rights in that. But thirdly, because I have a sense that the mood in the room, maybe I'm wrong, we will see it during questions and answers, but at least on this side of the room, I think you will find that there is pretty much ideological unanimity in one direction. Interestingly, I'm going to be a devil's advocate in my third part, and I'm actually going to concede that there may be a problem, and I'm going to ask whether that problem has potentially already been remedied by the European Court of Human Rights. So ultimately, the perceived problem or the mischief which this Bill of Rights bill intends to uh, correct is actually not there. But finally, uh, and maybe that will be my most controversial part. I'm actually going to make the claim that this has nothing to do with the law. This is not a legal or jurisprudential debate at all. 
That's why most of us here in the room that are lawyers, we are simply a bit surprised by the attempts being made because ultimately at bottom, the issue is more political and moral than it is legal. The current situation is as follows. Cases allocated to a judicial formation from the United Kingdom are the lowest of all member states of the Council of Europe. Approximately since 2017 up until today, approximately 300 applications are allocated to a judicial formation. That simply means they are not dismissed at the outset. So that means 0.04 to 0.06 cases for 100,000 people. So basically, if the system was created to, to bring a balance between the national legal systems and the national courts and the European system, in the United Kingdom, is, it is as good as it gets. I've always said this, I said it to the Joint Committee on Human Rights, I said it to Peter Gross, the system, when it comes to our perspective, and also to some extent from the domestic perspective, it just doesn't get any better than in the United Kingdom. The system is fully embedded, ownership of the rights in question, rights brought back home, remember the mantra, which was the basis for the human rights, it's all come to pass. The controlling of the development of rights in the United Kingdom are within the United Kingdom. Because the court that I used to work at basically says little to nothing anymore in British cases. Last year, the court found two violations in two cases in the United Kingdom. France, similar country uh, population, and times more violations. Italy, 100 more violations. Again, so what is the problem? Where, how do we identify the problem? Because clearly when it comes to the actual sub-aggregate numbers, the mischief is difficult to find on that basis. I will come to because I don't think that is really the problem. Second point, the premise of the government is we will remain in the system. I take that as a given. And I view the Bill of Rights bill through that lens. Jonathan and Allison have already discussed some of those provisions. Clause 24 on the interim. Um, Jonathan Mance gave his Thomas More lecture a couple of months ago, three months ago. I basically could have read, up, read his lecture out loud because I agree with every word in that lecture. He very characteristically worded it, worded it as follows that there may be a violation of Article 34 of the Convention if Clause 24 is enacted. Let me be very frank, if Clause 24 is enacted, it is a clear violation of the Convention. There are no ifs, ands, or buts about that. Under the Convention, an interim measure by the European Court of Human Rights creates a, co a Convention-based international law obligation on all member states. So a provision of national law which directly prohibits national courts for having regard to interim measures is and will be a clear violation of the community. But let me move to a, a clause which hasn't been mentioned, which I find very interesting, which is clause five, which deals with positive obligations. So this is a clause which basically tells the courts that any post-commencement interpretation, which includes a novel positive obligation, is not permitted under the Bill of Rights. And also has a, another provision when it comes to pre-commencement positive obligations, which requires, based on certain criteria, that they be put under a lot of scrutiny in their application. So what does the bill mean by positive obligations? Let me just recount a few positive obligations which flow from the case law report. Does this mean that the development of the positive obligation to investigate a death caused by state agents is somehow put into question? Does anybody in the room know where these positive obligations come from? They come from a case called McCann versus the United Kingdom of 1995. 
when SAS agents went over the border in, from Spain into Gibraltar and killed provisional IRA members. And the European Court of Human Rights said, well, there is a right to life under the provision. That's a substantive right. Now, that right simply is meaningless unless when the state takes a life, the state has a positive obligation to investigate. Now, this positive obligation isn't under development. Will that be called into question? What about the positive obligation to put in place special protection for the mentally disabled? Will that be called into question? What about the positive obligations to take account of the vulnerabilities and special status of children in criminal proceedings, custody proceedings, and migration proceedings? Are they no longer applicable if, if there are any developments of that po positive obligations under the convention? What about, it's interesting that the Bill of Rights puts such emphasis on the freedom of expression. Freedom of expression should be granted an apogee of rights. What about the positive obligation on states to guarantee a media landscape that promotes freedom of expression and pluralism? What about that freedom of expression, positive obligation, which is actually very much developing in the case of our in the internet era, in the cyberspace era? That's certainly going to be a potential post-commencement interpretation of the positive obligations, but in the United Kingdom, if the Bill of Rights is enacted, will not be prohibited, will be prohibited by the courts in their application of the convention. So what about the positive obligation to sanction hate speech? and incitement of violence on the internet, which is again developing in the courts because novel features of that positive obligations come to pass. What about in the metaverse? And so forth. Simply, I do not understand what clause five is meant to do. Will it create a risk of potential violations of the convention? There is no doubt. But ultimately the bottom line here is the Bill of Rights Bill, in, all, in many of its manifestations, simply is asymmetrical to the underlying premise that the United Kingdom intends to stay within the Convention. And maybe, as because Jonathan mentioned this, could it be that that's the point after all? That after all, the idea here is, because it's difficult to pinpoint at this stage, I will come to some of the frictions, it's difficult in day-to-day -day cases to grasp cases recently decided, and I want to pinpoint that, that can manifest themselves in real difficulties for the UK constitutional system, as I said, because the relationship is so well developed. So my third part, and I'm going to be the devil's advocate. Let's proceed, and I will concede that criticism, I'm, I'm conceding it for the sake of argument. Let's, let me concede that if I would have been in the court in 2005, I would not have decided Hurst versus the United Kingdom as it was done. That the prisoner voting rights case is debatable as a matter of convention interpretation. But where, where are we with prisoner voting rights? The government submitted ultimately a proposal to the Committee of Ministers with an absolutely minimalistic version of what they wanted to do. The Committee of Ministers said, fine, done, case closed. So prisoner voting rights, yes, let's imagine for the sake of argument that it's a debatable interpretation of the matter of law. Is it a current problem in the United Kingdom? Or is the specter of it a problem? It's not certainly not a problem vis-a-vis -vis the conventions. Secondly, migration. That's, that's the issue which one mostly hears from members of the current government. My, my answer to that is the instances that they're looking at, the actual cases, mostly, almost all of them predate 2010. I took part as a judge of the court, and we are being criticized by NGOs all over Europe maybe someone in this room disagrees with the retrenchment of Article 8. But to say that the European Court of Human Rights completely prohibits the deportation of foreign criminal offenders is simply factually incorrect. That is because the case law has quite heavily developed 
in the last decade. And interestingly, the, the current Justice Secretary talking about Robert Spano in the age of subsidiarity, re referring to me, is actually admitting that that has happened. So again, where does the problem lie? Are there instances before the national courts where the application of convention law, which allows for deportation of foreign criminals, which has been recalibrated in the last 10 years quite heavily, with a series, for example, of Danish cases, Denmark was the foremost country criticizing the Strasbourg Court on this. There is silence now and then, simply because the problem has been remedied. So, second issue, the factual claim underpinning that response, that reaction is, in my view, simply not correct. Extraterritorial jurisdiction. The government has been criticizing for a long time the court's expanse of Article 1, in particular into conflict areas. This goes back to uh, the incursion into Iraq in 2003 and British forces. We all know these cases, al Qaeda, al Jeddah, and others. But what are we seeing now? Russia has invaded Ukraine. Russian soldiers are on Ukrainian soil, so they're outside their territory. In other words, if Russia is to be held accountable for actions by their military personnel on Ukrainian soil under Article 1, you have to, by definition, accept extraterritorial jurisdiction. You can't have your cake and eat it too. The United Kingdom has clearly stated in the Committee of Ministers the European Court of Human Rights should enforce its case law on extraterritorial jurisdiction. In that space. Again, you can't have your cake and eat it too. It demonstrates that the, the, this case law, which has also been severely limited over time, is now starting to, to demonstrate its meaningfulness and purpose within that context. So, ladies and gentlemen, my final point what is this really about? This is really not about, at least, it's difficult to see. That it is an act, it's actually a legal and jurisprudential debate in the sense of, and now I'm speaking from the perspective of a former Stradbroke judge and president of that court. That relationship, if there is a mischief in that relationship, it's difficult to define it at the moment. There may be cases now and then where there, that will prove problematic. But the problem here is, in my view, and this, these are my final words. The actual problem here is one of the use of the democratic concept, parliamentary sovereignty, politicians talking about the people of the United Kingdom want this or that. The people meaning the majority. It is an unfettered majoritarian concept which does not view the democratic concept as an inclusive one, which requires the public interest to take account of the interest of all. So there is no democracy without rights. And if there is democracy with rights, there needs to be an independent arbiter of the existence of those rights. But the development in Europe, including the United Kingdom since the Second World War, has been an acceptance that democracy goes hand in hand with a rights-based culture. The second is multilateralism. The idea that the destiny of any country is fully developed internally without external interferences. That is, a, that is a political and moral debate. I have my view, everybody has their view. But the final point that I would mention, and I, I'm gonna pose a question, why is it, and now because I've moved to London and I'm working here, studied here, why is it that in the 46 member states of the Council of Europe, the United Kingdom is the only country, the only country where government has submitted a bill before parliament with the substance that we are seeing today? Why is that? Thank you.
Okay, the next speaker should be Paul Craig on the Zoom. You're muted at the moment, Paul. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, can I share my screen? Let's see if this works. Okay. Is that, uh, can you see the slides? Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for organizing the seminar and thank you very much indeed for um, allowing me to participate from a distance. Um, I'm teaching for a semester at NYU in Abu Dhabi, so hence not being able to be there in person. So I've only got 15 minutes and I've been really fascinated and intrigued by the previous presentation, so thank you very much. I've been asked to address the impact of the BRB on the protection of rights. And when I was thinking about this, I thought without having seen, of course, or heard any of the previous presentations, I thought it's inevitable there's going to be overlaps between issues that have been addressed in the previous presentations. And my topic, since the BRB does impact on the protection of rights in various ways, and those cannot be hermetically sealed from issues which have been addressed earlier. But I think it is instructive to draw some of those issues together to appreciate the diverse ways in which the BRB does have an impact, almost entirely negative, on the protection of rights as compared to the status quo ante. So I'm going to scoot through in the time available a number of different ways in which the protection of rights is rendered less good. So I begin with an issue, with two issues, both of which were addressed primarily by Alison. One is the protection of rights and interpretation. And as Alison notably put it, um, this is a kind of RIP, rest in peace, for section three. The courts instructed that they are indeed no longer required to read and give effect to legislation so far as is possible in a way which is compatible with convention rights. So um, that goes. So what are the points to note about this? Alison's made a number of points, but let me just go through a few of those in my own terms. Firstly, as we know, there was much discussion in IRA as to whether there should be a change to what is now Section 3. IRA concluded rather modestly in, the, in that respect. There were, I accept, different views on that issue. I have always been in the camp that thought that Section 3, as currently interpreted by the courts, actually cohered with the intent underlying the HRA and that actually, in most cases, it did not press interpretation too far. But secondly, the BRB has gone for the radical option, no amendment, just straight repeal, let's push section three off the edge of the legal cliff, no amendment, just repeal, subject to the points that Alison um, very helpfully made about clause 40 and the potential saving of some past uh, Section 3 interpretations. But pressing a bit further about what's going to happen in the future, so it's obvious that the necessary outcome is that protection of rights is diminished insofar as the courts are not required to read legislation so as to give effect to convention rights, with the co consequence that guidance and the guidance case law disappears subject to 40, clause 40. But that still leads to related questions. One is a little bit cheeky, um, but I'm sure it's going to come up in litigation at some stage, which is that are the courts allowed? They're not required, but are they allowed to read legislation so as to give effect to convention rights? I'm sure that counsel for the government would be up in arms 
about legislative intent if anyone made that argument, but I'm equally sure that the argument will be made at some stage if the BRB becomes law. And the follow-up question is, assuming the answer is no, that that, that uh, you're not allowed, you're not required or allowed to read legislation so as to be um, consistent with convention rights, because that would run counter to the true intent of 12A. So that leaves the obvious question, what principles and of interpretation can and will the courts deploy? Now, the obvious answer, at least as a starting point, would be the fallback position that courts read legislation so as to comply with international obligations, which still include the ECHR. And that then prompts the further inquiry as to the relative strength of that interpretive obligation, because it's pretty clear from the existing case law that that interpretive obligation is not one size fits all, but the interpretive obligation to interpret the obligation to interpret national law to be consistent with international treaty obligations is infused with varying degrees of force in varying circumstances. It'll be very interesting to see in a post-BRB world, if it becomes law, how much force the courts give to that interpretive obligation. So we move then quickly on to protection of rights incompatibility. There is, in my view, approximate and significant connection between Clause 12a and Clause 7. So while the former, as we've seen, reduces the court's options when interpreting legislation to render it compatible with convention rights, the latter, it seems to me, is at least, uh, as Alison puts it, at the very least, it's deference on steroids, and perhaps even more than that. If you take the wording of it seriously, it seems to me if you took a textual approach to Clause 7, it arguably removes much of the pure judicial function in the determination of whether legislation is compatible with convention rights. And then picking up a point that Robert made um, astutely a moment ago, the idea of any form of independent arbiter, if this is true, the idea of any form of independent arbiter of rights determinations is significantly diminished as a result. Now, the reason I am pushing this potential view is because of the wording of Clause 7. It's lengthy. It's, in, it's entitled Decisions That Are Properly Made by Parliament. And Clause 7 then delivers what is said on the tin, as it were, it states that the courts must regard, must regard Parliament as having decided when passing the legislation what is the appropriate balance between convention rights, different policy aims, and, uh, be and between different policy aims and the convention rights of different persons. We then get the follow-up idea that the court must give the greatest weight to the principle that such matters should be decided by parliament in a parliamentary democracy, etc. Um, now the point, uh, and of course, at the very least, this is deference on steroids. But what I'm still toying with in my mind is why or in what way the front part of 7.2, read with 7.1, leaves any judicial function to the court. If you're saying that this is an instruction coming to the courts with parliamentary sovereignty that inheres in the BRB if and when it becomes law, that the court must regard parliament as having decided this issue. I'm not quite sure what room there is for the court to do anything other than say, well, you know, Parliament decided this balance and we have no locus, as it were, to decide to the contrary. Um, a few further comments on section on Clause 7. 
as we know by definition, and we, hence the veracity of Allison's uh, comment that this is that this is um, at the very least a uh, deference on steroids. As we know, um, clause seven is definitionally intending to reduce the power of the courts over and beyond what they already do. So the courts already know, uh, exercise, as we know, considerable deference, respect, weight when reviewing legislation under the HRA. The very idea that, would, that the courts in the UK are vehicles of judicial overreach, um, where they, as it were, just impose their view on the interpretation and balance of convention rights over and beyond that of the executive or parliament is simply nonsense, doesn't withstand any scrutiny in the light of the existing case law. So the clear intent of the BRB is to limit further the judicial function in deciding whether legislation is compatible with convention rights by instructing the court that it must regard the balance struck as appropriate. A further point, and it, this picks up and develops on Alison's point about parliament versus executive, is that the assumption that when devising legislation, parliament really has necessarily cast its mind to the appropriate balance uh, between rights or policy aims or anything else, it simply does not withstand examination. Why? Because the paradigm of many cases before the court is not a clear and unequivocal piece of legislation which has made a policy choice about the balance of rights which somebody then contests. What often happens is you've got a complex piece of legislation where the particular rights-based issue was not apparent to anyone when the legislation was initially enacted. And indeed, the problem only became apparent when the issue, fact, when the legislation starts having an effect and the issue comes before the court. There are countless cases of this kind. To pretend in those circumstances that Parliament has already decided the appropriate balance between rights or the appropriate balance with policy aims is, I think, fanciful and misconceived. Um, I'm mindful of limits of time, but I think I've got a little bit longer. Um, uh, Vikram will shut me up if necessary. So protection, the third limit, protection of rights, minimum and, and maximum. Okay. Clause 3.3, three. no one has addressed this one. I think it's important too, certainly if you're talking about protection of rights. What Clause 3 tells us is that the court determining a question which has arisen, arisen in connection with the convention right cannot give a more expansive interpretation unless the court has no reasonable doubt that the ECHR would adopt that interpretation if the case were before it. But subject to that, a UK court can diverge from the Strasbourg interpretation. Two comments on this. Firstly, it builds a prima facie one-way ratchet into the BRB. Difficult for a UK court to give a more expansive reading of a right, not difficult to interpret it more narrowly. Secondly, this clause sits ill at ease with the general approach of the BRB to the ECHR, which is regrettably to remove and reduce the impact of the Strasbourg Court. Um, the rationale for the legislative equivocation in this respect is simply political, to prevent expansive interpretation of rights. The BRB framers general preference is rights to be narrowly construed, and Clause 3 simply serves that purpose, even if there are good reasons for the right to be more expansively interpreted in the UK context than the Strasbourg Court itself is capable of doing, given that the Strasbourg Court has to frame a judgment which is applicable to all members of the Council of Europe. Um, moving on then swiftly, protection of rights, substantive limits, positive obligations. Robert has also already spoken eloquently about this. Um, just to say a few words about it myself, clause 
a court may not adopt a post commitment interpretation of, of a convention right that would require a public authority to comply with a positive obligation. So three brief comments. There are clearly firstly going to be cases where it's contestable whether the interpretation would require the public authority to comply with a positive obligation. The very line between the two can be contestable. Um, secondly, given that Clause 5.1 does preclude positive obligations post commitment, it clearly does limit the protection of rights since the interpretation of the right might be more efficaciously protected in this manner. And I need do no more than refer back to the terrific examples that were given um, from the Strasbourg case law about absolutely uh, clear instances where a positive obligation is required and to argue that these things are no longer possible in a post-commencement world is uh, extraordinarily um, regressive. More particularly so because positive obligation is defined broadly to mean an obligation to do any act. Extraordinary. And then we get clause 5.2, which requires a post-commencement court to consider whether to apply a pre-commencement interpretation of a convention right that requires a positive obligation. In deciding whether it should do so, the court's required to give great weight to the need to avoid a positive obligation that would have the consequences list listed in clause 528E. Again, a couple of brief comments. Firstly, clause 52, it seems to me, will inevitably have, not only could, but will inevitably have the effect that a lower court's going to depart from a precedent set by a higher court, unless we want to pay fancy, play fancy jurisprudential games about the BRB in this respect, having somehow set aside those earlier precedents. Subject to that, a lower court's going to depart from a precedent set by a higher court. Secondly, the considerations that the court is instructed to give great weight to are open textured, contestable in application, and some verge on the reductionist. Consider in this respect clause 52A, the ability of the public body to perform its functions, or consider even more so clause 52E, that you have to go through this reasoning process where a positive obligation might affect the operation of the primary legislation. Well, definitionally, it's going to affect it in some way. Uh, the language in that sense just seems to me to verge on the reductionist. Um, very, very briefly, because my time is up, very briefly, again, to refer to a different kind of um, diminution in rights a substantive limit. These uh, I can my my time's up, so let me just say very briefly. Um, clause six, which has already been mentioned, the limits on convention rights in the context of those subject to custodial sentences. Note here: the only thing I'd say in the very limited time I have available is. While there has, in the context of prisoners, been, as Robert said, significant jurisprudence about whether they have the right to vote, etc. Um, and I always thought that the UK was wrong in this respect, um, and Strasbourg was right. That was always my view. But note here that Clause 6 is nonetheless novel, because it goes way beyond the voting issue. It applies in relation, the instructive, the imperative given in clause six applies basically to all rights in the convention other than the four listed in clause six, seven. So it's on a different level of magnitude in terms of limiting um, uh, um, convention rights for prisoners. And equally in terms of deportation cases, 
Clause 8, so severely limiting the extent to which a person to be deported can rely on the right to life. And equally, and perhaps even more worrying, Clause 20, severely limiting the extent to which a person to be deported can rely on the fact that the right to fair trial will not be given in the country to which they're being deported. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. And last but not least, David Kelsey. I am um, going to talk about common law fundamental rights and uh, whether they could uh, contribute to plugging the gaps created in right protection uh, where the Bill of Rights will come into force. I've prepared two versions of my answer. <laughs> One in case I was under severe time constraints. No. <laughs> I prepared another one in case I was on slightly less time constraints. And that is barely at all. Um, since I have a few minutes, you do. Um, you I, I want to to explain why. <laughs> we have to start by looking at it from the point of view of what these common law rights are. They are limited in scope. Rights of this kind have been recognized in a number of fields. They cover particularly access to courts and tribunals, fair hearings, property, and the centrality of property should never be forgotten. Freedom of expression a fundamental right more honored in the breach than the observance. Equality, to some extent, possibly life, although I'm not entirely sure about that, and freedom from torture. Those, I think, are the rights. They do nothing but any other convention rights. And quite a few of the attacks that my colleagues have talked about on rights lie in relation to other rights. That's the first problem. Second problem, in the area where you're applying them by way of judicial review, um, the operation has the effect principally of having a heightened level of scrutiny of official action. Uh, we have whatever you want to call it, anxious scrutiny. You follow our brows and look seriously, which may or may not make a difference. But um, in, in, in other areas, it works principally as a tool of statutory interpretation. Uh, it encourages judges to read down the very broad empowering provisions in legislation one often finds. And you read them down in order to make sure that as Lord Hoffman famously said in Sims, we don't have parliament by mistake authorizing very intrusive um, intrusions on important rights um, by using broad language, but not giving their minds to or justifying sufficiently the particular effects that this has in particular cases uh, of, of great sensitivity. He put it in terms of what he called the principle of legality, but Parliament, who wants to interfere with these very important rights, should do it expressly or by necessary implication and take the political plaque that follows. Those were different times when the political plaque was likely to follow. 
hundreds of fields that have the functional map. So the um, that's pretty limited if you think about it. There's no equivalence at the uh, level of statutory interpretation to Section 3 of the Human Rights Act. And even that, as Paul has said, wasn't used particularly vigorously in, in, in my view, like his. So we have a limited scope for these rights. It may be that new fundamental common law rights might be invented, you never know. But I've seen no particular sign of judges being willing to do that. And the area in which they seem particularly unwilling to do it is the area of private and family life, where the common law has historically been extremely reluctant to interfere um, with, with, with uh, the, the rights of uh, 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 people to interfere with privacy. Now, in the light of that, let me think about briefly how the different um, and most serious uh, restrictions on rights in the bill uh, could possibly be remedied. We're told, we were told back in Osborne in 2013 by the Supreme Court that one should approach problems through common law and statute before jumping straight to the, uh, the convention rights. Um, so how would this work? Well, as I've said, they won't really help us with the loss of section three. Of the Human Rights Act. They won't help us with the loss of capacity to develop new positive obligations because the typical fundamental common law rights don't work on that or more or produce positive obligations. <clears throat> Could they help with? The prisoner problem, the, the, the very strong um, provision uh, which, which has been mentioned, uh, which makes it difficult to um, give effect to the convention rights of prisoners, um, all six, which is revealingly headed not stuffing prisoners, but public protection. It's an interesting thing that because it suggests that somewhere in the back of the government's mind is a great attachment suddenly to collective social rights, the right of the community to be protected. Uh, they, they, they never seem very keen on any suggestion that the parliament might legislate to give effect to, for example, uh, the, the, the conventional and economic, social and cultural rights in domestic law. But this is the frame in which they're presenting this significant restriction of, uh, of, of rights of prisoners. Um, there was, before the uh, Human Rights Act, a certain modest improvement in the uh, treatments of prisoners in relation, for example, to um, parole decisions brought about by a combination of judgments of the European Court of Human Rights and judgments of our domestic courts in various judicial review proceedings. So, um, when the um, clause, clause um, six, tells us to give the greatest possible weight to the importance of reducing risk to the public from offenders. Um, it is open to a court to say, well, simply as a matter of common law tradition, 
we should give society that the greatest possible weight is not as much as the government might want it to be. But I don't think it's safe to assume that that will have enough of an effect, if any, to uh, compensate for what's being lost. In relation to deportees, uh, and Paul mentioned uh, called AIDS and its associated provisions, um, it's very unlikely, I think, that the common law would compensate for a lack of protection there at all, except possibly in relation to um, duty of fairness, procedural fairness. The place where common law fundamental rights um, most obviously took effect in relation to uh, people awaiting deportation or awaiting an asylum decision, the JCWI case was uh, a case where the um, courts decided that it breached their fundamental rights to deprive them of any means of earning a living was done by legislation. And then prevent them from getting the benefit of support from local authorities. That combination, or all central government, that combination reached their uh, rights not to be subject to degradation. That doesn't go very far. So I'm very pessimistic, I'm afraid. The only other thing I'll say is I don't understand Clause 8 at all, because Clause 8 starts by saying that it applies where a question as to the compatibility of legislation relating to deportation is being considered. But then all the considerations that follow are to do with the circumstances of particular potential deportees and their family. I find that bizarre. I don't see why that should be relevant at all to the compatibility of the rule as a whole. And what's even stranger is that the person to be deported seems not to be allowed to have any family rights taken into consideration because the, 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 the clause is talking entirely about manifest harm to a qualifying member of that person's family that is so extreme that the harm would override the otherwise paramount public interest in the moving person. What about the overriding extreme manifest harm for a person to be deported? They're simply not allowed to consider that. And because of that, I suspect that this may be one of the provisions, and there will probably be several, in respect of which people will be seeking one of the early declarations of incompatibility under the new bill. Thank you. Now, uh, it is 6.30, and uh, the deal was to put end at 6.30, but I will take a few questions if there are any. Otherwise, there will be drinks next door, which there will be plenty of chance to ask any questions you might do. Are there any questions? Oh, one. I have a question, particularly for Roberts, about deference and the uh, EPHR. Um, there are growing criticism, even without the Bill of Rights Bill, in, in force that the courts have taken a turn to difference domestically. Uh, cases such as Jimmy Fagan have been brought up as sort of this, something that wouldn't have happened a few years ago. This is, I think, Professor Conor Geerty wrote an article to this effect in London Review of Books. And I want to ask you whether you think the reason why the UK has such a low um, failure rate at the, uh, at the ECHR. It's not just we have the best uh, 
human rights system protection in the whole of Europe, that perhaps the ECHR and judges are worried that such a major country is going to leave and other considerations. So whether it's not just the protection, but there are other reasons. Well, I think, I mean, that, sort of to reformulate the question, the question is, is the stature of the United Kingdom in the Council of Europe system, its long history, founding member, and the criticism that was leveled at the court after Hearst and especially came to its sort of culmination in the Brighton Declaration when the United Kingdom was held the presidency of the Council of Europe in 2012. And what has happened later is sort of the court taking account of that and retrenching. And I think on, on top of that, it, that a similar, the argument has also been made that, that after the domestically, that after Miller one and two, uh, you can see the same kind of reaction within the UK Supreme Court. My answer to that, this is not as simple as that. The law develops over time and any judge that is worth his or her salt is going to be willing to listen to arguments that the evolution of the law, especially human rights law, which is very much a, 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 a discipline of law where law and policy by definition are somehow merged with these very general principles and clauses that have to be interpreted in light of the way in which contemporary societies develop. I would say that the generation of judges that came to the European Court of Human Rights after 2008, and then the generation that I served with, is a generation of judges that were recipients and were practitioners at national level and understood the way in which judgments are workable or not in the national legal systems. The judges in the initial stages of the court after 98 did not have that experience. And so for me, this is rather, the, the answer is rather a natural evolution of the law where there is a recognition that there are limitations to the reach of the law. I don't think it is, don't think it is at any conscious level, a sort of a retrenchment because of political considerations. Uh, the law is not mathematics. And I think this is simply a recognition that judges do take account of the way in which their products are received. Uh, and in a, in, a, in a democratic constitutional democracy, that is, that is the right thing to do. Right. Any more questions? Um, I'm interested in the panel's views on whether this is an overly cynical interpretation. Um, it seems to me that it could be argued <laughs> that the purpose of the bill is to create the very evidence base or a move away from the convention that was not found by the gross review. And by that, I mean that by creating these tensions where cases go to Strasbourg, it is looking for a fall guy that will set up interpretations that are then capable of being exploited domestically. Is that a, an overly politicized and uh, cynical view? <laughs> Or a comment on that, but I'm not sure that the calculation is yeah. as sophisticated as that. Um, and then, I mean, as things stand, it's not clear that any member of the government supports this bill apart from the Justice Secretary. <laughs> so, um, I, I, used, I used the expression sort of square in the circle. This is, I think, Dominic Rob, who has a very particular view about all of this, it's very long standing, it's his particular attempt. The square the circle at the time of producing the bill at any rate the premise was that we'd stay in the convention and it, and um although he seems to be havering on that question that is as things stand still government policy so this is his attempt to do that whilst making good on a long-standing conservative party commitment to revise the human rights act um and i think in various ways this attempt fails um and my impression is actually quite a lot of the government agree, either because this for them is all a diversion or because it doesn't go far enough. Um, so I think the I think the idea that this is all a great plan on the road to leaving is is probably really I mean it, it might have that effect if it simply I don't think this will become law, but if it did, it might have that effect. But I don't know that is the calculation, that's my own view. Yeah. 
Anyone else have any views? No, Paul, anything <laughs> to add? No, any other questions? Yeah. The follow on for that one, they want what you call the prognosis model for the bill, whether we're like to see it, I don't know, in terms of manifesto commitment to scrapping, scrapping in right back for prognosis. Right. Maybe. When I start with Paul, what do you think the prognosis is? You're muted, I think. <laughs> I didn't quite hear the question. Could you could you just re-paraphrase the question? Or well, yes. What's the prognosis for the bill? What's the diagnosis? So you have to have the diagnosis first, I think. And then, what's the prognosis? Is it going to come into law or not? Um, well, I think there are other people around this table who are better placed than <laughs> I am to make that. Who've got their ear closer to the ground in that respect than I have. Okay. Um, uh, so I would defer to their judgment, but everything I've heard, everything I've heard coheres with what was just said. In other words, that this is a Rob introduced bill that it is not widely supported by other members of the cabinet for a concatenation of reasons, um, either as was just said that it doesn't go far enough or that they regard it as a bit of a dog's dinner, which is exactly what it is, and that therefore um, it's, you know, not really fit for purpose in that sense. So um, it seems to me that, but I will defer to other people who have their ear closer to the political ground, I would be surprised, but also depressed in equal measure if it did become law. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Uh, who wants to? I don't have a very close in ground, uh, but um, obviously nothing is going to happen until the uh, bullying allegations have been resolved. Because if you try and do anything with the bill in Parliament, you're not going to get discussion of the bill. You're going to get discussion of, oh, and by the way, <laughs> we hear you. <laughs> so there's, you're not going to get it. So there's no going to be no discussion of it until that has been resolved. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I think that is going to obviously delay it. Uh, I think in terms of, of where the bill is going, we're quite busy in Parliament at the moment, um, and there are other bills coming through as well. Um, so uh, retaining the revocation reform is, is obviously taking a lot of time in the House of Lords at the moment. Uh, the um, uh, minimum services, the, the uh, strike bill, uh, that, is, that is finished the House of Commons and is winging over to the House of Lords, so that's going to take some interesting time as we discuss the, uh, um, as, as um, my students have decided, well, that will stop the UCU going on strike, won't it, Bill? Um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, education is an essential service. We're trying to, so there's no definition of education, so they're trying to work out what will that include. <laughs> Versus, and what will it include? They're, they're great so they're to build, then, um, so uh, Only if it means that you have to have exams. And their natures. I mean, we can go on other strikes, but I think I think they seem to be preserving LM. They weren't spoke about underground. They they and I. But the masters, the BAs, no, no. <laughs> they have an interesting discussion. But I think they're quite busy yeah. at the moment with other things. And obviously, the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill is bobbing along. So I I think if it comes back, I'm not so sure it's for this session, and I think it might be. Discussed and perhaps changed a little before it comes back. I, I don't know. David? I, I think it's worth remembering that um, reform and or replacement of the HRA has been a Conservative manifesto commitment in every general, general election since the Act was passed in 1998. By Labour. Labour's human rights. Right. Right. Conservatives have never been happy with it. Yeah. And um, so I think it won't go away. But so I, I, I think this bill will, will, will not get anywhere, partly for the reason that we've heard about Donald Raab's own political future, and partly just because it is such a dog's dinner, it will be another battle in the House of Lords, mm -hmm. which um, the government may well not be up for. But I agree that it won't go away. So what will be interesting is what the government says, what, what the Tory party says in its next manifesto. And whether it will live to regret not having taken the advantage of gross review, having had this big review, and so well, we've had a big review, and let's make the modest, mainly non-legislative changes recommended by gross 
and including ones that touch on what Robert was saying about the relationship and the culture and the and the and the, um, the dialogue about about human rights. So the extent it's not really a legal problem; it's a problem of of understanding and dialogue. It could have done things about that and said, "Well, that deals with it for the next however long," but it didn't do that. Right. Okay. Well, uh, oh, we got one more. Oh, that would be great. Two more, <laughs> two quick ones. Okay, quick one. Um, putting this in the context of the rise of post Brexit populism, because we've identified that this is largely a political debate rather than a jurisprudential one, I was just wondering if any of the panelists would have any comments to arguments that are hinged more on the visceral sort of reaction against European intervention and that sort of broader Euroscepticism rather than legal arguments. Right. Can I just give an anecdote when it comes to that? About uh, three months ago, I was took a cab from the outskirts of London. And uh, the cab driver was very verbose and asked me, so what, what do you do? And I decided- You I didn't would, answer. I, 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 <laughs> I meant to answer. I, I, I simply decided I'd just tell him everything. <laughs> so I just said to him, why just step down as president of the European Court of Human Rights? And you know, I just wanted to see the reaction. And he said to me, which was, I hate Brexit. I voted against Brexit. We are part, we should be a part of the European Union. But I can't stand the idea that a foreign judge tells me. That. So, which I found very interesting. There is something about that concept, and it's not just in, in the United Kingdom, it's elsewhere as well. It's something about you know, this idea that our lives are being determined or rules which guide our lives by someone which is not a national, which is not internal. It's an interesting one. Uh, it's difficult to sort of pinpoint why that is. We have that in my own country. I come from Iceland, by the way, which is a Nordic country. Uh, but it goes to it goes to a bit the, the nature of the debate we're having, which is the debate of government or power being essentially nation-centric, at least power that governs our lives. Uh, and I think that is, in my view, as I am a multilateralist and internationalist, I find that I find that problematic. It's not something we can simply dismiss. I think it's important for us to recognize it. And what I would say is we, we I say it's still we, I left four months ago, but during my time in the Strasbourg report, this is something we were very mindful of. And how did we react? I think we did react. I know it needs normative and empirical analysis, but my claim is we reacted by making the jurisprudence of the court when it comes to any spectrum more less invasive than it was 10, 15 years ago to the chagrin of many that want the court to be very activist. But that was a reaction that rights should hold. The principle of subsidiarity should be developed at national. Is there one more question? Yeah. Hi. Um, do you think that this bill could clash with the Equality Act? And if so, what effects do you think that could have with people on people who are currently protected by the Equality Act? You may want to have to think about that. Okay, I think that's too complicated to answer. Too complicated. <laughs> In any circumstances, having overrun by it. 15 minutes. But if you would join me in thanking our very illuminating speakers. Well, there are three in the room at the end, and uh, we hope you.